Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to our third the Provost Lecture Series. And again, I would like to, every time I would like to thank uh, everyone who made it possible for our Provost Lecture Series. And, and Scotty, I, I found the picture um, on, on Google. I thought that was pretty cool. And everybody else is the <laughs> formal picture. So again, let me highlight people from the Provost Office and also people from the CPR and uh, also many stakeholders to uh, uh, approve the um, Provost Lecture Series. And so today's lecture will be given by Professor Tom Bouguignan, who was recently promoted to associate professor with tenure. And so, so this uh, frame, picture frame, will be given to Tom after his lecture. And very briefly, so since I'm uh, Tom's mentor, so I think it's only fitting, so I will introduce Tom uh, for uh, I time for eight minutes before uh, Tom takes over. And so Tom joined um, OIST about um, six years ago. Yeah, something like that. And uh, uh, so he leads the evolution uh, of evolutionary genomics unit, so you can see from from this picture, um, uh, little creatures that Tom is very passionate about. And so when I was assigned as Tom's mentor, I still remember he came to my office. And our research field is very different. Right? So, so I'm in the area of engineering, microfluidics, but Tom works on um, cockroaches. So first, I, I try to clarify to you, uh, is termite the same as uh, cockroaches? I still remember. And uh, he said yes and no. And, and then Tom asked me if, if I have any advices for him to, to get tenure, to survive an OIST. So I thought really hard. And uh, then my question to Tom was, oh, maybe you can work on something else instead of termites. For example, really cute hermit crabs that's abundant in Okinawa. But Tom was so nice, instead of telling me this is a crazy bad idea, he said, uh, I will consider <laughs> in the near future. <laughs> And uh, uh, so within the past five years, so Tom has been very productive. He leads a very productive unit. And um, so for his tenure reviews, um, so we got some really, um, uh, he got flying color uh, comments such as he's an extremely high scholarly distinction, leading scholar in his peer group. He has been very productive and impactful uh, researcher and the leader in starting termites, cockroaches, and uh, their associates. So, um, um, so I would like to thank Jill, uh, so Tom's wife sitting in the back, who provided a lot of nice pictures and to help me to understand who is Tom really. And uh, so, so here are some pictures of uh, 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 so Tom and Jill before they got married, and this is their wedding photo, and and their two kids. Uh, this picture was taken more recently, and uh, so I prepare five slides, and I want people to pay attention to to Tom's hair. <laughs> okay, Tom's childhood. So younger and uh, teenager years, I learned that Tom is a very good uh, ping pong player and at a competitive level. And so I, I think we should convince Tom to, to go to lab four, now there's a ping pong table, and heavily used so, so you can have some battleship with uh, your unit members and other, and other professors. And, and Tom also had a really cute bulldog when he was a kid. And so, so we want to highlight this. And uh, this is another picture, but, but pay attention. So all the pictures here, Tom had a lot of hair. <laughs> and so these pictures highlight uh, Tom during his PhD and postdoc years. And uh, uh, of course, beer, it's always important for people from Belgium. 
And just, so this picture shows Tom is super happy and professional in the field collecting samples. And also, so by looking at this photo, I was quite intrigued. So, so Tom was holding a, a garbage bag. And I assume this is how you collect samples in a very scientific way. Yeah, <laughs> that, that sounds quite easy. And again, in the forest. And I also understand that Tom uh, works very closely with um, uh, his mentor, who is uh, also a termite expert. So they, they have uh, traveled together, worked together, and uh, celebrating their, I, I guess, uh, nice collections with beer. But I, I noticed this picture, Tom, you, you look a little awkward and not super happy. And I wonder why. <laughs> And so this slide was uh, sent to me um, by your unit members. And I was very happy, so you can see, you know, throughout the years, so Tom's group has grown. And, but I believe the, this afternoon while I was preparing, I, I believe there's a typo. Unless if Tom, your unit, you predicted future in 2019, everybody was wearing a mask. And this is probably 2020 or 2021. And this is a more recent, I guess, unit photo. Uh, apparently, Tom in this picture is more relaxed and happy, probably after you learn that you got tenure. <laughs> and this is a post-tenure celebration. Um, so this photo was taken this May um, after the OIS uh, graduation ceremony. And two students from Tom's unit uh, received their PhD uh, very quickly, well, within five years. And this is a picture uh, when Tom was uh, back in Belgium in September this year and taking a well-deserved rest. And I was very jealous about the hot chocolate and ice cream and waffles. And that's hard to find here in Okinawa. And so one last slide. So, so Tom works very hard during the day and on the side. Uh, so professor by the day, at night. So Tom apparently is a very good dishwasher. Uh, very serious if, if you zoom in. And so he's rubbing the plates very vigorously. And so he's also a very good father, helping his kids for bug hunting, DNA extraction, and so on. And so finally, so Tom is also a hairstylist on the side. And so you can see from this photo. So obviously, I'm sure you have passion, a lot of passion with, uh, with hair. And, but this picture, by looking, I'm not sure who this person is, but uh, your, your brother, OK. And all the kids were maybe watching TV, but uh, so your niece didn't look very very relaxed, <laughs> and uh, apparently two people were working on, on uh, your your niece's hair. So, uh, so I'm I'm sure you gained a lot of um, hairstyling experiences over the years. That that's also very helpful for for your research program. And so finally, I I just want to to end and thank everybody who. Uh, who is here, and after Tom's lecture, um, uh, so we'll serve uh, some coffee and snacks uh, so in the patio area. But there's uh, some surge with COVID cases. So again, everyone should be mindful and uh, do not talk uh, uh, too close to each other. And, uh, and also a preview, so we have um, another two lectures already lined up in January, so uh, 24th. Uh, Professor Laurino will also give her uh, provost lecture um, to celebrate also her promotion to associate professor with tenure. And in February, so um, uh, Professor Olf Skoglund uh, will give his kind of departing lecture, uh, so we'll celebrate uh, his retirement. Um, so, well, I think I should stop and let Tom take over. Okay, hello everyone. So thanks first, Amy, for this uh, very nice introduction. I mean, I think you did it much better than uh, what I would have done by myself. So thanks a lot, <laughs> thanks a lot for that. Um, so, so, so yeah, so I'm uh, passionate by, uh, I have a passion for bugs. 
uh, dense the title of uh, of my talk. So, like before my my my, my talk, some people just like told me, uh, "Oh, Tom, you are going to talk. I mean, your 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 seminar is so long. You are going to talk for for two hours." Um, so I want to reassure everyone in the room: I'm not going to talk for two hours. I'm supposed to talk for 40 minutes or something like that. So the two hours include all the snacks and the coffee that you will have uh, after one. So, so, so yeah. So my understanding is that this uh, uh, series of, uh, of seminar is supposed to be uh, much more like personal. Uh, so they, they will. I'm going to talk a bit, of course, about about research, but that's maybe only a, a part of, of of my talk. I will maybe talk a bit more about uh, maybe how I how a Belgian guy maybe uh, uh, finally uh, became one of the 10 or 20 Belgians now living in, uh, uh, in, in Okinawa and greatly contributing actually to the amount of uh, Belgian population in Okinawa because in order two uh, of my lab members are also Belgian. So, so when I when I was a kid, I wasn't so much into uh, bugs. So I think like Japanese kids are often uh, they, they often like bugs. Uh, but like in, in my in my case, what I liked was much bigger creature. So I, I was really uh, I had really a passion for for dinosaurs. So like here you can see uh, the very famous at least in Belgium we think they are very famous uh, the very famous uh, iguanodon of uh, Bernisar uh, that you can uh, see in the National uh, History Museum in, uh, in 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 Brussels. And I really love these very big, uh, big animals. I wasn't so much into the, the, the tiny bugs. So my passion for, for bugs just like came later, maybe as a, as a teenager, uh, where uh, when I started to uh, collect uh, all sorts of, uh, of, of bugs, but especially still those that were very big. So I didn't really have a, a passion for things that you cannot see very easily. Uh, I mean, I think that everyone's a bit like that. You, you, you want to see big things. Uh, and so here are a couple of, uh, of uh, bugs that you can find in Belgium, uh, among the biggest uh, beetles uh, that, that, that we have. Uh, I mean, of course, they are quite small compared to what you can find uh, in Okinawa. So uh, then when I went to university, uh, first in Liège and then in Brussels, I uh, wanted to uh, study uh, biology uh, with the idea that I would one day just become an entomologist, someone that, 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 that studies uh, insects. And because in the University of Brussels there are not so many uh, uh, people studying insects, the choice was actually quite small. And I ended up uh, working on, uh, on termites with Yves Roisin that you can uh, uh, see uh, here. Uh, termites was not like so attractive to me because termites tend to be like relatively small, they are whitish, they are, they are not really appealing in their, in their appearance. Uh, but uh, Yves convinced me to work on, uh, on termite for my master thesis because uh, because uh, a lot of uh, in termite colony, you can also often find beetles. So, like the this this is a beetle that you can find only in some some termite colony. So, like these beetles live only with termites. You never find them anywhere else than in termite colonies, and they are very very specific. So, you have like one beetle that um, that is specific to a particular species of of, of termite. So, this is a, a staphylinid. For those who know a bit about uh, about beetles, but they don't necessarily look like uh, staphylinids. So that's what's very cool about them. They are really tiny, but they are very beautiful, I think. So like here is uh, uh, a few more pictures of this Termitophilus uh, staphylinids. So they, they really don't even look like beetles. They look more like some, some kind of larvae. Uh, you find them actually with termite larvae, and uh, they, they don't really look like beetles. That, that's like a normal, uh, what, what normal staphylinids normally look like. Uh, but, but these guys, because they, 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 they live in the termite colonies, they really just like acquire some particular morphology. Uh, they are very slow, uh, and, and they, 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 they are very well integrated in, inside uh, a termite colonies. Hence, they have this sort of like weird shape. Um, yeah, and one good point actually about uh, uh, walking on termites is that uh, uh, they are uh, tropical insects, right? And that means that if you want to walk on termites, then you need to go to collect them in the tropics, which was quite attractive to me. I mean, uh, the Belgian weather is not, uh, it's not what we have the best uh, in Belgium. I mean, Okinawa is much nicer. I'm very happy to be in Okinawa right now, rather than in Belgium, uh, to escape the winter. And, uh, and therefore, I did my PhD, so I fell in love uh, with, with termites. First, it was with beetles, but then I fell in love with termites. And 
I uh, went every year to uh, here is Fr French Guyana uh, to to tropical rainforest to collect uh, uh, some some beetles and have good times uh, in the in the rainforest. I mean, like good time, it's it's all a question of definition because uh, for people that don't like mosquito, for example, then tropical rainforest is probably not a great place where to go. But if you don't mind mosquitoes, then it's pretty good. And I did my PhD on uh, on the termites, therefore, of, uh, from from uh, French uh, Guyana. And after four years, so in 2010, I finally uh, defended uh, my uh, PhD thesis that was uh, very specific. So it was about the uh, anoplotermes group. So it's a group of termites that uh, have no soldiers. Normally, termites have soldiers and walkers, but in this group of, of termites, uh, there are no soldiers. So they lost this, they lost their, uh, their their soldier caste. And um, yeah, so 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 after that, of course, I wanted to do some uh, uh, some postdoc, and I had uh, uh, several possibilities. So I, I got this grant from uh, from Belgium. Then I, I, I had someone uh, from uh, Florida that was uh, proposing me to go uh, for for a postdoc for a two years postdoc in Florida in uh, Fort Lauderdale. So that's my representation of uh, Florida. I mean, there might be some other representation, of course. I mean, nice nice beaches. Uh, but I, I, yeah, it's a bit paradoxical, but I wasn't so much attracted by these nice beaches, although I ended up in Okinawa where the beaches are very nice. I was more uh, attracted by the uh, cold uh, Hokkaido, so in, 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 in Sapporo. So there, there was termite biologists there, even though they are basically no termites, except for one invasive species in, uh, uh, in, in, in Sapporo. And, uh, and yeah, Sapporo is a very nice place, but it's very cold. There is a, there is a, a lot of snow. So it, it's actually not that different from, from Belgium, except that there is more snow and it's maybe even colder than, 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 than Belgium. So I stayed there for two years. That was uh, quite uh, enjoyable. I uh, had a really good time there. I mean, there were a, a few, uh, a few uh, problem or a few uh, difficulties on the way. I mean, maybe uh, notably uh, uh, that was the time also of uh, uh, Fukushima. Uh, I mean, the great uh, uh, earthquake uh, and, and Fukushima. So I was in Hokkaido. So I, I mean, like I, I was listening at the news and in Japan, they said, yeah, don't worry, everything is okay. And my, my parents just like phoned me, they just told me, oh, you need to go, go back to Belgium as soon as possible, uh, it's going to blow up. And so it was a bit uh, difficult uh, time. The water disappeared from the shelf very rapidly. I mean, one week there was no more water on the shelf, but we still had toilet papers. So <laughs> that was okay. And I decided to stay basically in, uh, uh, in, 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 in Hokkaido, uh, and, and I, I think I did not regret this choice. It was, was a very good uh, experience. However, um, at the end of this postdoc, uh, un unexpectedly, I basically just like uh, ended up uh, three months before, not knowing uh, where I will do my next, uh, where, where I will do my next uh, postdoc. So I, I applied for these grants. I really thought I would have them. I was really just so naive. Uh, I mean, some of the grants I got them two years earlier, so I couldn't imagine that you can fail what you got actually two years earlier. But it was a very good lesson. Uh, so yeah, so I ju basically just ended up three months uh, before the end of my contract, with possibly with uh, with, with nothing. Uh, uh, after after this contract is over, and uh, yeah, so I just like started to uh, uh, apply to a couple of jobs and try to see what I what I can do. And uh, uh, lucky me, I uh, found this uh, uh, postdoc advertisement where they were looking for someone who uh, work on a plant insect interaction, especially on uh, termites and ant uh, ecology. So this was exactly my profile. So I just apply and I I, uh, uh, I got the offer, and therefore I moved. Uh, to uh, Singapore. So in 2012, I moved to Singapore, which was uh, it is good and bad, of course. Um, I mean, NUS is a very it's a very nice university. I think it's one of the biggest uh, uh, university uh, in uh, in Asia. Um, so it was a good place where where to go. It's also where I met my wife in in Singapore. So that was another a good reason to go there, although I didn't know that in advance. And and. Uh, yeah, for some of you that, uh, I guess that if you think about Singapore, you probably think about something like that, right? So it's like a, a very fancy city, a lot of skyscraper, um, 
yeah, like the, this is yeah, very, very nice, very nice place that, that could look like uh, some big city somewhere in the United States, except that it's really uh, tropical. Um, but actually in Singapore, you have also uh, some uh, nice uh, natural uh, places. So you still have some tropical forests. So all the center of, of Singapore is basically tropical uh, forest. So you have, I mean, the tropical forest is of various quality. You have like some really good, nice, primary tropical uh, rainforest, and you have also some more like secondary uh, uh, forest. So things that have been cut down and then regrow, and and maybe like 50 years ago or so. But you have quite a lot of uh, of uh, animal diversity in this forest, and you have quite a lot of termites. I think I collected something like 70 species all together of termites in Singapore, so it's not, not that bad. Um, yeah, so this was like a picture at that time uh, in, uh, uh, in Singapore. So, so at that time I also wanted really uh, a lot to basically move to Australia. Uh, so I've always been more more attracted by the East, and maybe yeah, if you if you just like go first to Japan, go to Singapore, then I mean the next step must be must be Australia, right? So. So I made a series of applications. I mean, it was quite quite uh, difficult. I got rejected several times, but I think it's so it's so it is right. When you apply to a grant, uh, you often are rejected, and then you should just like reapply again and and try to to get the I mean to to use the commands that, uh, that that you got from the reviewer to improve your grant application, and then ultimately trying several times, you just like end up uh, uh, succeeding. So after uh, two and a half years, I finally moved to uh, uh, to, uh, to Australia. So in Sydney, I don't see many of these in uh, in Sydney. You can see them in the Sydney Zoo, but not really in the city. But if you just get out of uh, of, of of Sydney, I mean, it's full of of kangaroo uh, everywhere. And. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I spent, uh, uh, so th this was a picture of, uh, of the, the lab member while then in Sydney in this, this nice, uh, like uh, 19th century uh, building in the University of, uh, of Sydney. And at that time, uh, I, I, I was invited with uh, my, my boss at that time, uh, Nate, Nate Lowe, uh, I was invited to uh, Okinawa, to the University of the Ryukyu, to uh, give a seminar uh, at the University of Ryukyu. So I was invited by uh, Tokuda-san, who is still one of uh, my collaborators uh, uh, now, and, and yeah, Kinjo-san here, uh, who uh, was a student of Tokuda-san and became a postdoc uh, in my lab for four years. And during that trip to uh, Okinawa, I also had uh, my first experience of the uh, local gastronomy with this uh, delicious uh, tebichi uh, soba. So it was in 2015, and of course, uh, uh, the Ryukyu University is actually not too far from uh, Oist. And uh, uh, therefore, we visited also. So, like here is a picture of uh, uh, some research that we did with, uh, with Simone and also with uh, Tokuda san and Kinjo san. Uh, was published uh, uh, two years ago, and uh, we visited we visited uh, uh, Oist. So uh, that that actually uh, uh, Nate uh, at Oist. So for the first time, I, I, I was at Oist, and th this picture is taken exactly in the place where my lab is now located. So I don't know if it is some sort of like. A, a Premonition, or uh, but I visited basically Oist and went exactly uh, visiting exactly uh, the place which became my lab uh, uh, two years uh, two years later, and yeah, here is the only picture that I was able to find of me at Oist at that time. So I'm just there, uh, looking on the bridge between uh, I think the central building and the the lab. Three, three, I believe is a, no lab two. Sorry, yeah, I'm always confused with the number. Still, after five or six years, um, and and of course, when I, I came to Oise, I was very uh, uh, impressed. I mean, first of all, I, I like Japan. I tried several times to apply to assistant professor job in in Japan. Therefore, I, I wanted to come back to to to, to Japan. And when I visited Oise, I, I just thought, oh, it's a really great place. I, I really would like to uh, to be here. So. I just started my fellowship at the University of Sydney, but I thought, okay, I'm just going to make an application just for this one. So I, I never really applied much to assistant professor position. Uh, maybe just, yeah, I did maybe five, 10 applications altogether in the past. So I just like really thought, okay, I will put all I have, try to get uh, the best possible application. And I was uh, invited for uh, for interview uh, 
uh, so soon after, so I was very happy about that. I, this was the title of my talk at that time uh, in 2016, in April 2016. So investigating the factor explaining the rise of termites to dominance. Because I really wanted this job, I really put in a lot of effort. I think sometimes it's what you need, right? I mean, if, if you really want something, then you need to put in the effort. You need to basically work very hard. So when I was invited for, for this interview, I, I, I worked maybe on my talk and my, my interview for perhaps a month, just like really only working on, 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 on that. But it was worth it, right? So at that time, I proposed yeah, to, to investigate the, the factors uh, explaining the rise of termites uh, to dominance. And uh, the logic behind that is that uh, termites are extremely abundant in uh, tropical ecosystems. So in uh, tropical rainforest, but also in tropical savanna. So here you can see some uh, termite nest. And this is more visible in tropical savanna, actually. So, so here is a picture uh, from uh, Australia, around uh, Darwin in, in Australia. And all these are termite mounds. So all these termites basically feed on the grass, and they feed on the wood uh, that they collect uh, in, in the savanna. So like the, the, the animal biomass that termites represent is actually really huge. So altogether in tropical uh, ecosystem, termites make up up to 25% of the animal uh, biomass. So they are the most abundant animals uh, together uh, with ants. So they are so abundant because they are the main decomposer of uh, lignocellulose. So lignocellulose is basically wood, uh, and this is the most abundant uh, biological polymer, biopolymer on Earth. So if you feed on the most abundant compound on Earth, then obviously you can potentially become also yourself extremely uh, abundant. And they are also considered as ecosystem engineer in the, in the tropics, meaning that they really shape uh, the, the ecosystem. So, so, so what I propose is to, uh, to just like try to answer this question. I mean, it's a question that you cannot really answer because it's a very, va uh, very vast uh, question. So it's how did termite basically became so uh, important in tropical ecosystems. So why, why is it that they are so, so, so abundant? Why is it that they are successful uh, or that they are among this, this very successful group uh, of organisms? So when I uh, came, so yeah, so, so as Amy pointed out, the timing of the, of the picture is not always, we always just like take pictures after, um, uh, at the end of the uh, of the financial year, so it's always like this picture are always sort of like one year one year later. Uh, but but here we are not masked, therefore you cannot you cannot see that we are actually a bit a bit delayed. And uh, so I just like came to OIS and uh, uh, started the evolutionary uh, genomics unit. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess that you might wonder, because so for now, I mostly talk about termites and about my passion for bugs and so on. So why actually uh, uh, naming uh, my unit the evolutionary genomics? Why not name it the bug unit? Or I don't know. I mean, I think the, the evolutionary genomic unit sounds, sounds, sounds very cool, but there, there is also like some additional reason why, why I think that the name fit basically uh, what we are uh, trying to do. So I mean, like the question that we want to answer is like, oh, uh, the termite became so important in tropical ecosystem. I mean, we also do similar kind of work on the on the cockroaches, and you could, I mean, like wh what I uh, we did at OIS uh, more recently is to work on how do termites uh, gut microbial community digest lignocellulose and evolve. So basically, how they can process wood and how they evolve. Um, with uh, their, their microbial communities and how the termite colonize the world. And to answer this question, we basically use some uh, sequencing techniques. So we just like sequence a lot of specimens. Uh, we just assemble uh, some genomes, bacterial genomes, termite genomes, and we try to compare these genomes. So what we actually really do is some sort of evolutionary genomics. We try to, to compare these genomes and from this comparison, understand basically how this genome evolves and how termite evolves and how the coevolution uh, between termites and their uh, uh, microbes uh, works. So, yeah, okay, so now uh, that I just like uh, present it uh, or, or just explain about like uh, how I, I got here, maybe let's talk a bit about what we did during the uh, last uh, five years. So, five and a half years more, yeah. So, so I'm not going to talk about everything. Uh, I mean, all the papers that we, that, that, that we publish or every uh, single thing that, uh, that, that we did. I will just like take a, a couple of uh, key examples, which I think are, uh, are representative of uh, the work that we do and which are also like important uh, for the unit for other uh, reasons. So 
uh, this is a, a, a paper published uh, by uh, Alesh uh, in 2019. So here we build the phylogenetic tree of termites uh, using transcriptome data. And what actually I, I really like to do is to uh, collect uh, some information, some data about like many species. So uh, we just like sample the termite phylogenetic tree. We try to get as many samples as possible to sequence them. We have, a, we have a question, we sequence as many species as possible. And then from there, we can try to understand how how it works. So basically like how termite digests lignocellulose, but termite in general. Uh, I think so there is really some uh, uh, advantage to work on drosophila or to work on mice because uh, biological systems are so complex that if you want really to go in depth uh, on how this biological system works, you need to focus on some particular organism. But the problem of that is that sometimes you miss a bit about uh, the the, the, the diversity uh, of, 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 of this world. And if you find something very interesting on Drosophila, you never know if it applies to other insects, if it applies to other, other animals. Uh, what you need to do is to just look at it on many species, and then you can look at the common rules. Uh, and something which is a bit overlooked, uh, I think, in, in science for, for good reason, because it's, we, cannot, we cannot have hundreds of modern organisms, right? So we need to have a few modern organisms. Uh, but this comparison among many species is also quite important. And so here is another uh, uh, phylogeny uh, built by, uh, by Simon, who is here today with his uh, mom. Uh, and um, so, so all termites basically are wood feeder, but uh, some also like evolve soil feeding. And within this group of soil feeders, some uh, uh, reacquired a diet based on wood. So this is when you compare like many species uh, that, that basically uh, evolve independently the same traits, like, like here. So like you have two groups that independently re-evolve uh, wood feeding, and there are more that are not shown on these three. When, when you just like uh, study this, you have some inde independent replicate. So the problem is that if you, uh, let's say, study two species of Nazi termes, you will never be able to know if it's something unique to Nazi termes or if it's something which is more linked to the trait that you study. So what you need is to have like independent replicate, right? Independent replicate, independent phylogenetic uh, uh, replicate. So this is the kind of thing that I, I like to do, to just like sequence a lot of uh, specimens. So we just like take a lot of, uh, of termite samples and we just like compare, compare these samples. We take into account the phylogeny and we try to understand uh, what a particular trait, for example, what's the, the consequence of the, this particular trait, what are the correlation between, uh, between traits. So here I'm going to uh, show a few examples of that um, very briefly uh, with the idea of like uh, trying to determine how do termite gut microbial community digest link nodes and uh, and evolve. So, so what we did is to pick up a series of, uh, of, of termite, to, to select a series of termite species, to get their gut, to sequence what they have uh, in their gut. And uh, from there, we can just infer quite a lot of things, actually. So we can build a phylogenetic tree. So here's the host phylogenetic tree of termite. And we can also reconstruct phylogenetic trees of the uh, gut microbe that you can see uh, here. So then we can compare these phylogenetic trees, and we can see if they match. So that basically tell us whether, uh, how, how, how well, basically, termites and their gut microbes co-evolve. So if they co-evolve really strongly, then you expect uh, the, 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 the tree to match uh, very well. We can also, like from this uh, metagenomes, we can also infer uh, the, the functions of the gut microbiota. So we can just look at the genes present in this uh, metagenomes and from there, from there infer what the gut bi uh, microbiota actually do. So, so here is a neat map, so very, with a lot of, uh, of colors and so on, so I don't expect you to uh, understand every details of this, uh, of this heat map. Uh, so like the, the column uh, indicate termite species, and here you have a phylogeny uh, of, of termites, and the row indicates some uh, bacterial uh, family. So it basically shows like, the presence of particular uh, bacterial family in a particular uh, termite species. And uh, what you can see actually from, from, uh, from, from these graphs, I mean, you see a lot of, of colors, you see some, some group of bacteria that are particularly abundant across uh, all termites. So, so what you can see is that actually the gut prokaryotes involved in the main nutritional function uh, are present across termites. So 
all termites basically have the same type of gut prokaryote. They have different strains, but they have the same uh, family of, of gut prokaryotes that help them to digest wood and to digest uh, soil. So basically the termite gut microbiome is largely conserved. So it's inherited from the common ancestor of all termites and it has been passed down for, for, for a very long time. So uh, we also looked at, uh, we did some PCA, some principal component analysis, to, to look at uh, what's the difference between uh, termites feeding on different substrate, between soil feeders, wood feeders, termites with protist, termites without uh, gut protist. And you can see some clusters. So like here are some soil feeders, here are some uh, uh, wood feeders, here there are some wood feeding termites that have no protist, uh, and, and this uh, a plot basically represents uh, a casein, so like all the genes that are involved into wood digestion, into uh, polysaccharide uh, digestion, oh, sorry, into a car carbohydrate uh, digestion. And the same patents also uh, uh, is also found for um, other groups, uh, so other other type of. Uh, of, of, of genes, so the genes that are important for termites, for example, the genes involved in the nitrogen metabolism. So uh, basically, there's really a difference in terms of uh, metabolic capabilities of the, 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 the gut microbiota of soil feeders and the gut microbiota of wood feeders differ in their uh, metabolic uh, capabilities. And What's, what's, uh, what's, what's interesting is that it does not really differ in terms of what is present or absent, but more in the quantity of it. So uh, here is, again, some, some casimes, so some uh, carbohydrate, some genes involved in uh, carbohydrate uh, metabolism so that, that, that are involved into the digestion of, uh, of lignocellulose. And uh, you can see uh, some uh, that the soil feeders basically also have actually the same gene, but they just have less of it. So in this metagenome, you see less uh, uh, genes involved, uh, less casimes, less genes involved in, in carbohydrate uh, uh, metabolism. So basically what's, what's happening is that the acquisition of a diet of soil was accompanied by a change in the stoichiometry of genes involved in important nutritional function rather by the, than by the acquisition of new genes. So you basically keep the same, but you just change the, the proportion uh, of it. Yeah, then, then I'm going to talk a bit more about the uh, co-evolution. So that, that's like a, uh, something that I'm interested in for quite quite some time. Uh, so, so if you really just like compare two trees, the trees of a hose, the trees of the gut microbes, then you can sort of like determine uh, how well they just like co-evolve together. So if it's really just like the bacteria are passed on from mother colony to daughter colony over millions of years, then you expect the phylogenetic tree to perfectly match. I mean, of course, in reality, it's never exactly like that. Um, and you can... Uh, infer co-divergence, you can also just like see if there were some loss and also if there were some uh, host switch or some horizontal transfer among, among hosts. So here it's, uh, it's some analysis that we did. Uh, so all this work is the work of GSA. Um, we, we compare the, the termite phylogenetic trees with phylogenetic tree of, of microbiota, of, of particular lineages of, of gut microbes, and actually it matched very well. It matched extremely well. It matched actually so well that, uh, uh, I mean, of course, you can see that there are places where it doesn't really match. You have also like the, the, the you know, like when you do phylogenetic reconstruction, there is always some uncertainties in the tree that you obtain. And it matched so well that actually, uh, here is the rate of transfer that we estimated for uh, mitochondrial gene compared to a termite mitochondrial genome phylogeny. So in reality, we expect to have zero, but because this doesn't match, we have rates that are higher than, than zero. So we have this like rate of transfer, which are below 0 0.25, and we have quite a few bacterial lineages which have similar rate of transfer. So that means that we can explain the coevolution between this bacteria and the mitochondrial genome uh, of termite without any horizontal transfer. Like basically you could imagine only vertical transfer and you would observe similar uh, patterns. So basically that's just like uh, uh, let us uh, suggest that actually uh, some association probably date back to more than 150 million years. Uh, so the time when termites first appear. So like they've been passed on for tens of millions of years. 
And uh, you can see these patterns on uh, other termite, uh, other bacterial phylogenetic tree. So the, this is like color coded. So that's termite phylogenetic tree, like here, for example, in blue with uh, microcerotermies. And you can see this big cluster. Uh, in the bacterial tree that are composed only of sequences that come from uh, microcerotermies, meaning that these bacteria, you find them only uh, with uh, microcerotermies. You find them nowhere else. You don't find them in other, other termite gut. You also don't find them in uh, other environment, like in the soil or wh wherever else you can imagine. They are only associated with termites of the genus uh, microcerotermies. So that's what you, explain, you, what you expect uh, when you have like a lot of like vertical uh, inheritance. And yeah, and so this this is something that we uh, we uh, observe for quite a few uh, for for a series of uh, of uh, bacterial lineages. Of course, some bacterial lineages inside the termite gut don't follow these rules, but some dominant uh, bacterial lineages uh, seems to be mostly vertically uh, transmitted. And this was the work of uh, of uh, Gigasa uh, that uh, graduated this year uh, in uh, uh, March uh, uh, this year. Um, yeah, so, so we keep on working on this, on this, uh, on this uh, topic, and uh, now what I'm particularly excited about because I'm, I mean, this, this metagenomes they, they are very, um, they are nice, but they are also like very frustrating. I, I really expected to get much more from 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 them. The problem is that they are very fragmented, and so you cannot infer pathways uh, uh, very well. So it's very disappointing, to be honest. Although like there are interesting things that you can do with them, but what we are doing now that uh, that actually uh, is much better is that we are using this uh, PacBio iFi long reads. So like the difference is that these Illumina reads are about like 150 base pair, while the PacBio reads uh, are, are 10 to 20,000 base pair. And now we can actually assemble full genomes, uh, full, full bacterial genomes from uh, termite gut uh, metagenomes, and that's actually quite exciting because then you can really look at the genes and you can really look at the pathways uh, for a given uh, groups or a given uh, bacterial uh, genome. So let's uh, finish by talking a bit about like how did uh, termite uh, colonize uh, the world. So like before I start with that, I just like want to explain how you can use phylogeny to uh, answer uh, this question. So here is a small termite phylogenetic tree. And what you can do is to date this phylogenetic tree. So, so it works is that you, you have some fossil records. So you know that, uh, for example, we have a, here a species of microsterotermies that you know belong to this lineage. So you can say that this node is at least uh, 10 million years old because the fossil is 10 million years old. So you can uh, provide a distribution of uh, probability. So you do that for as many nodes as possible. And from there, you can sort of like infer what is the age of every node on the phylogenetic tree. And you can also just, that also provides some confidence interval. But of course, there are some uncertainties about these uh, estimations. Then you can look at the distribution of uh, modern species. So like here, all these microsterotermies are found in Australia. Here, they are all found in Southeast Asia. And from there, you can infer uh, what was the state uh, of the ancestor. So, so here, in that case, you, 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 infer, you can infer that the ancestor lived somewhere in Southeast Asia and that this ancestor dispersed to uh, Australia. So you basically can determine when and, and how, how termites, I mean, from where to where they, they, they moved uh, around the world. So this is some work that I did in the past, it's a question that I am uh, working on for, for, for some time now before I, I joined OIST, uh, where we did, uh, uh, we did this work on, on, on all, all Termiti Day. And, uh, yeah, and we found like a series of, uh, of lineages uh, that, that uh, move around, uh, around the, world, the, the world at different uh, times. They mostly moved out of Africa, a bit like human, but much earlier. And uh, they, they moved to, uh, uh, to Southeast Asia, to South America, and to Australia at different times, so a bit later in Australia. So um, when I joined OIS, I, I managed to convince uh, Mengling uh, to uh, do her PhD on that topic. And she actually graduated also at the end of last year, so on the 31st December of last year, to be very precise. And uh, she just like continued the work, so she basically used all the sequence that we uh, generated, but she of course also added a series of, uh, of new sequences because we want of course to do new, new work, right? 
So uh, what, uh, I mean, I'm just going to present one of the things that she did, uh, which is a paper submitted now in ecography for more than one year. We always have like a round of revisions of six months. I've never experienced that for a journal before. So if you have to submit a paper to ecography, I suggest you just think twice. Uh, and um, so you have a series of uh, lineages that appear to be only specific to, uh, to Madagascar. So here is the summary. And uh, uh, we can basically infer that most of the diversity of termites present in Madagascar arrived relatively recently. I mean, recently at the geological time scale. It arrived between 10 to 15 uh, million years ago, which is a bit similar to the diversity of termites that you find uh, in, uh, in Australia. So there's always like this sort of uh, argument about whether uh, the diversity where you have like endemic uh, lineages in one place, like in Madagascar, is it something very ancient that dates from the time when Madagascar was still connected to Africa, or is it something more recent? And here we can say that, yeah, I think like it's something very recent, at least at the geological time scale. So now, I just want to talk a bit about uh, uh, why, because I mean, this type of work, I think it's very nice to do. It's natural history. I really love doing uh, natural history. But there are also like, some uh, uh, interest about uh, doing that. And uh, one of the points is that uh, I'm not so sure like, how much aware you are of that. But uh, Madagascar is a, a place where the nature has been uh, heavily damaged by, uh, by human impact. So like, this is a picture. Uh, from, I mean, typical kind of pictures that you can see from Madagascar nowadays. When you reach like 300 kilometers uh, uh, from Antananarivo, the capital of, uh, of Madagascar, you just don't see trees anymore. It's all gone. Uh, it used to be like covered by, uh, by forest or by, by savanna, so there, were, there was quite a lot of vegetation, but it's all gone. So like there are still people living in the bottom of the valley, so what they do is that they can still grow something, so what they do is that they burn uh, the top so the grass that you can see here, they just burn everything. So then when the, the rainy season arrives, everything is washed down uh, to the bottom of the valley and they can still grow something. But this is pretty much the only way or they can still grow something and it's not going to last forever, right? I mean, like all this, uh, all this land is completely infertile. You cannot grow much there anymore. It's, it's pretty much like a desert, uh, just like covered with some really uh, uh, small grass. And, uh, and, and still, like, like if you look at the, um, uh, at the natural reserve, so it's a picture taken in natural reserve in Madagascar, people are still cutting wood. So like this is still progressing, right? I mean, uh, that's, that's a, a picture of a bag filled with wood. So we were just like in the park and people just, we were people cutting wood. We just went there and they just like left, but they, they left also back uh, filled with wood. So even this natural reserve uh, are, are quite threatened. And, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the diversity there is going to be extinct in the next, I don't know, 20, 50 years. I'm not so sure. But he, probably a, a lot went extinct already. So, so basically what we can do is to uh, document this diversity. Uh, hopefully it will not go extinct, but I think it's very likely to go extinct, actually. So, yeah, so this is the kind of thing that you can do with a termite. So it's a nice picture of termite uh, from, uh, from Madagascar. So I hope that I... Uh, uh, managed to uh, convince you that termites are actually quite cool. And because I want to uh, end the talk on a more positive note than on the, the destroyed nature of Madagascar, um, yeah, I, I'm very happy. So this is a picture that Amy showed actually as well. I'm very happy to see my, uh, my two sons uh, liking uh, a buck as well. So I never really tried to influence them. They just like, got to like uh, uh, bugs by themselves. Uh, so I think in that case, it's not really uh, culturally inherited, but more genetically inherited. Their love for bugs were genetic, genetically inherited. Uh, and here is a, a, a picture of my older son, uh, Laro, uh, with uh, his uh, bug collection. So he called it his museum, uh, with some nice bug that, uh, that, that he received. And uh, he really loves to just like, when you look at bugs, he really likes, he really likes them. And I hope it will uh, continue. Um, so that's, uh, yes, I would like to thank everyone uh, uh, in my lab, of course, because uh, obviously uh, you never achieve things alone. You need, you need some people, uh, some good people behind uh, to, to, to be able to uh, uh, be successful. And uh, yeah, so like recently we had uh, uh, two new uh, PhD students, uh, Julie and, and Song, joining the unit, and uh, Kakosan or Greta UA, uh, who we are so lucky to have. And, um, yeah, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Yeah.